Hey, everybody. Um, so, yep, that's me, Dan Mumford. Um, freelance illustrator, working in London. Have been doing so for about about 10, 12 years now, so quite a while. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about my work kind of from the very beginning to now. Um, so like a proper like overview of my journey, if you will. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about creation process, that sort of thing, and a few other things, and look at a few big projects as well that I've got to work on. Um, so my work is generally very sort of detailed landscape sort of things. Um, this is a good example of the sort of work I do. Um, nearly everything I do now is done in Photoshop uh, using the Cintiq. Um, I, I used to work analog for a little bit and I'll show you some of that, but for me it's really become all about working digitally in the last seven or eight years. That's pretty much, just the, the, these are the products I mainly use for everything now. Um, <laughs> and sometimes I do stuff on the iPad on traveling, but um, just Photoshop and Cintiq, no vectors. People always think I do vector stuff, but it's, it's all pixels. Uh, influences for like my whole life pretty much have been these four sort of core categories. Um, <laughs> these are the things that I just love basically. So movies, video games, comics, and heavy metal music. And as I've grown up, uh, like those things have got more complex, more detailed, more crazy. The world's got bigger, the films have got more interconnected. You know, I'm living in like paradise with all this stuff right now, and the music's kind of stayed the same. But you know, I still those are still the things that I really enjoy and uh, I'm, I'm passionate about as well. Uh, I recently moved studio, so about three weeks ago, this is what my studio looked like, and it now looks like that. So I'm a bit happier with that. Um, it's the first time I've been able to sort of have a space where I can like build it to my specifications. Uh, for the last ten years, I was in a space that was sort of slowly built up over the years until it was just like towers of just rubbish everywhere. Um, so that's, that's been really nice and sort of got a clear head with my work now. Um, so I'm now going to go right back to 2004 to 2007. That sounds like a long time ago now. Um, and I went to Brighton University. That was where I did an illustration degree. And um, <laughs> I... It was a really good course because they kind of let you do whatever you wanted. So I didn't have to focus on uh, illustration in the traditional sense. I could kind of do whatever I wanted uh, to the point where I would do really cool movies like this. Uh, and that, that would take me a couple of days to do that. Uh, but I loved, I loved doing it. And I think I had this sort of idea that I was going to become a film director or something. I don't know. I, I don't really know. I just, because I love film and I always did love film. Um, so I did a lot of stop motion uh, film work. Using a camera, I would do like, you know, these eight minute films where it was all just stills. Uh, it was really stupid. I don't know what I was doing, but I did that for like a year uh, on the illustration course. And oh, I, that was really good because it meant no one was really telling you necessarily what to do. And I just sort of had fun. And I made really, <laughs> really stupid things like this short film where uh, I sold my face, and so then I had a skull for a face, and then I wanted to get my face back. And, um, <laughs> yeah, just this sort of intense black and white weird thing. And of course, I did all the music as well. I did the whole package. Um, look at that, it's the Halloween mask, yeah. I thought this was great when I was doing it. That's me. Yeah. I'm not going to show you anymore. You don't need to anymore. <laughs> it's really, really long though, way too long. Um, but that was the sort of thing I was interested in. And alongside that, I would do things like this, these sort of black and white line drawings, um, sort of inky, very splodgy, no color really ever, all black and white. And I, I don't know, there was, you know, it, it was, I guess it's sort of quite naive illustration. The style is very sort of loose and all over the place. And yeah, they encourage, you know, I was encouraged to do whatever I enjoyed doing. So that was, it was really nice. And th this wolf actually became incredibly important a few years later. Um, but at the time that was just a little sketch in my sketchbook. I got to do like cool little books. Um, this one's all about the boogeyman. So it's, you know, it was sort of like looking at the myth of the boogeyman and 
just making a little story about it. Um, but I always, you know, even at this point, I loved narrative, and I always wanted to sort of say something through the work I was doing. Uh, but I needed to sort of move past that a little bit towards the end of the university, and I started doing screen printing. And that was a way for me to look at color and pull color into my artwork. It was one of those key points that became very integral to who I am now, actually. Um, screen printing is, was and is very important to me. The way I build up my imagery is all based around screen printing. Uh, the way I layer images, it's, all, it's always very much uh, done in a sort of screen printing mind, if you will. So the, these were the sort of things I would do, um, taking those scrappy drawings and trying to put block color in there, trying to understand color, trying to understand color theory, because I didn't really understand any of that stuff. So I started to do things like this, where I would, uh, you know, I'd be doing all the printing myself and all the separations and just layering textures and, and things on top of each other. And I think you can sort of see where my work is now and the sort of starting point for these things. And it was really exciting because it was, and I only discovered this sort of stuff in the sort of last few months. And alongside that, I was doing uh, these more intricate pen drawings. And I, th I guess this sort of came from my love of comic books, essentially. The idea of these sort of really solid lines and those two ideas, these drawings and screen printing, they came together to form the basis or like the seeds of what I guess my style is or whatever. Or it was at least the starting point for where I am now. And then, of course, I moved to London um, with not much money and the idea of making it as a freelance illustrator. And yeah, that was the end of 2007, I think. And that was pretty hard, to be honest. Um, you know, coming straight out of university, I had this chunk of money put aside and I was like, OK, I'm going to try my hand at being a freelance illustrator. I'd had a few jobs working with a few bands and some friends. Uh, I, I was sort of on the, I'd just been doing quite a big job that I'll talk about in a minute. And, you know, I was in a position where I could probably make a go of it. But the, the, the real tough part was um, my friends that I'd moved in with, they all had like day jobs or they're graphic designers where they'd go to work. I was working at home. And man, I couldn't do anything. Like I totally failed for about six months. Just, I had these things to do, I couldn't do them because I was at home and it just like, I'd, I'd lost that sort of studio space and that working environment. So I had a real, really, really tough point then when I couldn't really do anything. Uh, eventually I got a small studio space in, a, in an agency called Jelly and they, uh, you know, they just had a desk that I, they were my agent at the time for a couple of years and they had a desk so I went there. And that really helped like mentally to be able to separate the idea of work and home life. And I think, you know, for some people, working at home works. For those that struggle working at home, totally look into trying to get somewhere you can work that's not at home. Because uh, for me, it's amazing. I treat it 100% like, a, like a, a full on sort of job where I go to my work and then I leave and try not to think too much about stuff when I get home. Um, and here's some really old photos of me in a band, uh, several bands. So. Look at me, I look great. Um, actually, no, I look best over there, I think, on that side. Yeah, so I did, that was my life when I was about, probably about 13 to 22. Music was super important to me. Artwork was something I enjoyed doing, but it wasn't my career. It wasn't any sort of thing I thought I'd make a life out of. So when I was having these issues with like not really knowing what to do and not knowing where to take my work, um, I'd kind of separated and moved away from the world of music and all the people I knew when I went to university. But um, the band Gallows, they, they were some of my friends and they had seen that little wolf drawing that I did. I'd actually turned it into a painting. And they were like, hey, we've got an album coming out. It's called Orchestra of Wolves. Do you want to draw some wolves? I was like, okay. Um, and we drew some wolves. <laughs> and they're these really crude little things, but they, you know, they were kind of like, the genesis of, of my career, essentially. Uh, I worked on it with another artist called uh, Alex White. Uh, she's now of We Three Club. And she did the white wolves and the type, and I did the black wolves. And, you know, it was fun. We didn't really know if anything was going to come of it, but that album came out, and then they got signed to Warner Brothers. And they asked me to just redo that album cover in a sort of really dark way with these wolves. And... That was really fun because they, they had a budget, you know, um, 
I, was, I had a big project to get my teeth into, something I could focus on, and we did these, these kind of crazy big illustrations. These were for like just little seven inch singles. And it was a really nice period of time because the alternative music scene had, it kind of was starting to find a new voice for itself, like hardcore and pop punk and punk and metal. Like there were all these little subgenres starting to form and they, they, the, the artwork I was doing was alongside a bunch of other guys and we were all sort of doing these really colorful drawings that it kind of helped give an identity this, to this new sort of sub, sub, sub culture of music. And um, it was super fun and I kind of, I wasn't a diva about it, um, but <laughs> the singer of Gallows, he, he's a very sort of strong, headstrong guy as well. And he's like, we can do whatever the hell we want. And I was like, why don't we do an album cover that has like no type on it at all? And, uh, and he was like, yeah, we're definitely going to do that. So that's, that's what the album looked like. And it did have it down on the side, but of course it's very subtle. There was a sticker, but you take the sticker off. I don't know. Either way, we got away with a lot, and that was really cool. Um, and to be honest, it's still one of the biggest projects I've worked on, because you know, there was a budget behind it where we could have a lot of fun and do all these crazy ideas. And that, that actually led into the first sort of five or six years of, uh, of my, my career so far, where I just did, I must have done over 100 CD covers um, for different like, alternative music bands. And then so many t-shirt designs. I, I got to guess like 400 plus at least. Um, and they were all very, all very similar sort of designs. And at the time, I, I also got a, a little, little Wacom tablet. And that was, that was helping me like speed things up. Because before I'd been, for the first year, I was doing everything on pen and paper. And it was very, it was slow for me. You know, I'd draw it, then I'd scan it in, then I'd color everything in with the paint bucket like kind of like a big stained glass window or something. Um, and I thought, you know what, I need to sort of try and streamline this process somewhat. So getting this little, little guy was amazing. Like immediately everything was going a little bit quicker. It just meant my output could be quicker as well. Um, and I, yeah, here's a quick run through of a bunch of these t-shirts. And yeah, this was like, I did this on Instagram when I was clearing up my studio, I just went through the archive. And this is just a small portion of it, but as you can see, I, I sort of made a real aesthetic out of what I was doing. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of scrappy. It's really colorful. Um, I know people liked it. That was a good thing, right? So I kept doing it and it got to the point where um, I, that was all I was doing, just music stuff the whole time. And it was amazing. I got some great opportunities, did some really fun covers and, you know, stuff that people really sort of really like still to this day. So that was really, really nice. Um, but then, you know, after five years, there was this point where I went, okay, like, can I really draw another t-shirt with a skull and a zombie and a wolf and a demon and I don't know, whatever. Like there, there's only so many times you can kind of repeat the same idea. And there wasn't really much room within that world for me to experiment too much. Um, like, you know, when I was doing album packaging and things like that, there would be a bit more room, but mainly it was t-shirts. And I sort of thought, Let's move on. Let's not move on, but let's try something a bit different. So I did uh, these sort of pencil, not pencil, but uh, <coughs> stippling style drawings that were just me experimenting with new techniques and trying things that I sort of wanted to try just for me. Um, and there were these really big drawings that um, would be like A0 in size, I think, if they're printed out. Like really intricate, really crazy detailed. And I love doing them. But the, it was interesting because like the response to when I posted this stuff and I, I put some of them on sale and it was kind of like, nah, no, not really that interested. It's fine. Um, which was really disheartening to be honest because I put a lot of time into these things and I just sort of thought, you know what, that's okay. Like I, this was for me, it came from the heart. These were the things that I wanted to try doing. And, and from doing these little projects, I, I learned like new techniques and new ideas and the sort of thing that I wanted to do. And I think it's really important to try and find those time for those personal projects because, I mean, for me at the moment, like everything I do is pretty much client work. And sometimes it's really, you know, you're trying to kind of want to find a bit of space to breathe. And um, that's an amazing position to be in. But at the same time, like having personal projects is really important, I think, because you can uh, just explore the things you want to explore. Then I got Cintiq. That was good. Um, as you can see, I was totally stoked with that. That was like the, the sort of the next next step up. Um, 
so where the, where the little Wacom had worked really well, moving on to the Cintiq was like another step up and instantly I could just pack in a load more detail and zoom in and you just sort of, all of a sudden, I was like, okay, this is, this is more like, I think, what it should be like. Because when you're using the little tablet, you're looking at the screen in your hands down here and there's that disconnect. So th this was sort of very much uh, another turning point for me where I went, that was, that was a worthwhile investment, you know. And um, the Cintiq range that they do, I think there's quite a few options. So I, I would say something like that or, or the iPads. Actually, they're really, good. they're really good tools now. And around that time, I started to do movie posters. I, I was asked by a few galleries. Uh, Hero Complex and Gallery 1988, I think, were the first in LA. And they just said, do you want to, I don't know, just do a couple of posters for us, see, see how it goes. And that was the starting point of kind of this second stage where I've moved into mainly movie stuff where I do work for, for galleries, um, for the studios, like licensed stuff, all, all, this sort of, all, all these sort of things. And it's, it's really fun because I've been able to ta tackle so many properties that are kind of dear to me, you know, really important things that shaped me when I was younger. And nearly everything I do, well, it used to nearly all be screen print. And that was obviously an evolution of the stuff I learned at university. But recently I've started to experiment more with uh, just full on CMYK G clay images where I can just put full on color in there and just go a bit more crazy. But as you can see, I go, I just go for it um, and really do these sort of bright, super crazy things. I really enjoy that. That's, that's kind of the last year for me, experimenting with these things. You know, get to do really cool, fun stuff like He-Man, Bojack Horseman, where Actually, something like Bojack, that's, that's an interesting one because I'm trying to put my own spin on a style that it, you know, it kind of has to look like that, but I'm putting my own spin on it. Um, and I always try and, you know, even if it's a really horrible image like Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I try and make it pretty in a way. Uh, you know, it's a lovely sunset evening. He's just going out for a stroll. Um, and that, that's always important to me. It always has to have a nice edge to it. And uh, also recently video games. I get to do some video game stuff, which I'm totally stoked about. Like, that's another big part of my youth. And, and still, I love video games. So being able to take part in that world, that's, that's really exciting for me. I get to do gallery shows sometimes. Um, 1988 in LA have been really nice. They, they've allowed me to do quite a few shows now. And that's another, another really uh, sort of nice thing I get to do where there's not too much, uh, there's not too much control really, it's very much an open thing where myself and maybe uh, the other one, some of them have been with other people, like we kind of just get to discuss what would be fun to do. And gig posters, like the last, last few years I've been able to do a few gig posters which are, is amazing because the, the whole music thing, I kind of stopped doing CD covers and t-shirts, but recently I've been asked to do uh, do, do posters for these shows and, and that's a really nice way to tie back into that that other love of my music and sort of bring it all back together so basically that's my life prints just tons of prints all over the place uh, my studio's got a massive plan chest that's already it was a brand new plan chest with extra drawers and it's already full like but that, that's what that's what I do I make prints and I sell prints um, like just prints that's it but before we go on to how I make those prints, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, something that loads of people ask all the time. Like, how do you get to the point where I'm at right now, for example? Um, well, it's taken me 12 years so far, pretty much solid work. And there's no, there's no like answer, to be honest with you. Like, I get asked all the time, how do you do this? What's the technique to do this? What brushes are you using? Like, how should I price this? How should I do this? And to be honest with you, it's all about just sort of taking your time to learn things, taking your time to sort of hone your craft and learn how to draw, just sort of taking inspiration from everything you can, but making it your own thing, you know? And when it comes to things like, um, you know, like I don't know how to do this, I don't know how to price this, or I don't know how to, I don't know what I should be doing with this job. Someone's asked me to do something. There's, there's, there's agencies out there that can help you with these things. There's, there's loads of agencies. And, um, you know, there's also the AOI, the Association of Illustrators. That's a really good resource where you can get a lot of these answers. 
And also, you can just you can ask people as well. Like, if there's an artist that maybe you know, or if there's an artist that you look up to, just email them, send them a message. Like when I was starting out, I had loads of these questions as well. And I there was a couple of artists I spoke with, and they you know they were really nice. They got back to me. They they responded and they kind of helped me get on the right path. Um, but there is no yeah, there's no like easy answer. You can't suddenly do something overnight. It's going to take time. It's always going to take time. Um, so let's talk about the creation process, like how do I do what I do? So here's a screen print. Uh, it's a four color screen print. The majority of what I do is, is screen print based. And here's a little breakdown essentially of how that image is built up. So it's quite simple. You can kind of, you can get your head around it pretty easily. Uh, here's a video of that being printed. And I think I'm going to talk over the top of this. Is my voice there? Maybe. There you go. So that is the wonderful white duck uh, printers. And um, that is a short from a small, that's just like a minute from a 10 minute video I did with the BFI. So that's on YouTube. I think it's on my website as well, actually, on the video page, if you want to see the full thing, go a bit more in depth about that. But that's, that's the very satisfying way most of my stuff is printed. I love, love that process, you know. It's, it's what I sort of learned when I was at university, so I'm really glad that I still get to create work that is printed in that way. And nearly everything is done just, well, that's actually my old studio, but that's the setup. Just an iMac and Cintiq and um, iPad sometimes when I'm traveling, but that's pretty much where everything happens. And it all starts just like this. Uh, I don't really do much sketching. I don't do much sort of thinking outside of the studio, actually. Like, I'm always thinking about work. I'm always coming up with ideas kind of just in my head, you know. When I, when I get a brief, nearly always I'll have a compositional idea in place pretty much immediately. Um, so I don't do too much outside of the studio. I generally, when I get in there, I just jot my ideas down. I have my, um, I have my pen sensitivity really high up. That's really important for me. It gives a lot of control, like a lot of fidelity. I work at 500 DPI, which is unnecessary, but again, it gives that extra sort of uh, amount of fidelity. Always have my guidelines set up. I think that's important. Always have an idea of where your center point is. And Old Classic, that's pretty much the brush I use. I've got loads of brushes, I've got loads of them, but Old Classic is literally just the default brush. Uh, there's nothing too fancy about it at all. It's just standard brush, and because nearly everything I do is, is line work based, that works perfectly for me. And uh, I use a combination of that and the eraser to sort of like chip away at things. Nearly everything starts just like this, a sketch essentially, that uh, I've built up using reference imagery and just sort of trying to work out what I might want to do. There's generally just sort of really basic guidelines that I put down and then build up the image from there. Um, guidelines to get sort of a perspective in place. And I kind of equate it to like standard definition in HD, you know, or maybe 4K or 8K, I don't know. Uh, like that's the, that, there's not too much difference, if you will. I always try and get everything in place and especially if you're working with a client that might be quite picky, you know, I want that approved at the sketch stage because the time difference between those two images and how long you spend on them can be huge. And uh, again, here's another example of, you know, very, very similar. The image hasn't changed too much uh, in composition. I don't do too many sketches. I generally try and, well, I, I'll do sketches for myself, but then I will normally just pick at least one or two that I feel are the best things to send to the client. Um, I actually think sometimes if you send too many sketches, they've got too many options, that can also go wrong, if you will. So I think it's best to try and have a, try and have a clear vision of what you might be trying to do. And then it's down to drawing. 
So I've got the sketch in place, got some guidelines in there for perspective, and it, it is essentially just me spending lots of time chipping away at these pieces of artwork, doing things in layers, masking areas off, um, pulling it all together. I always try and have it working really nice as a black and white image first, and then after that I start to layer in the color. And as you can see down on the side, I have the color in, uh, in separate layers, because I actually, I, I think, in terms of screen prints nearly always, even when it's not gonna be a screen print. That's pretty much how I make my work. So I'll be putting the color in and then erasing out the areas I wanna add the highlights in. And I just build up the image that way, uh, always sort of referring back to the sketch and then moving onwards till we get to a point where things are looking pretty finalized. <clears throat> and that's the thing, like when people always ask me about how you do it, it's just a bunch of drawing. You know, it's just lots and lots of drawing. That's essentially it. That, that's what it is. Um, that's, my, that's my favorite way to, to, to put it, really. You just got to draw the owl. Um, you know, there's more to it than that, obviously. But there is no secret tip or trick, you know. So now I'm going to look at a couple of bigger projects, uh, things that were sort of quite interesting to work on and had uh, and just really nice projects to work on. I'm going to start with Ghostbusters. You know, obviously a superb franchise that actually doesn't have that much out there in terms of the films. There's only the three films and possibly the fourth one soon, I guess. And there's great artwork out there for it already, like fantastic artwork. And because there's only those two films, I mean, no one's really doing artwork for the third film, unfortunately. But the, there's just those two main films that people want artwork for. And um, that kind of means that it's, in terms of what there is for Ghostbusters 1 and 2, and let's be honest, it's mainly just one. It's very oversaturated. Um, but there's all this amazing artwork. So about four years ago, I was asked to do something for the 30th anniversary, uh, being a, a part of a show. And I thought, okay, cool. I'm going to put everything that's cool about that first film in this one print. And, uh, and I did. Uh, it, was, it was good. People liked it. Um, it went down really well. But then off the back of that, uh, Sony actually asked me to do two DVD covers for the re-release uh, to sort of coincide with that anniversary. And they went, so we love what you did. We want you to do something for the first film and the second film, but we don't want you to put anything that you put in that poster on that cover. And I was like, well, you haven't left me anything. Like, what am I gonna put on it? So we sort of, that was really annoying and tough to work out, but came up with this thing based on the start of the film. And actually it's a moment that's not really done by many people. I, I think it's quite untouched in terms of artwork for the film. And it, it's a really good moment because it's when they sort of first realize, okay, ghosts are real in this world. And it, it's, 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 you know, it's just, it's literally the first five minutes of the film. Um, but that was a really fun one to work on. But then we had to do something for the second film. So we did a river of slime, which to be honest with you, when you think back to the second film, you, I don't know, the, se the second film, for those of, the, of you that know it, it's just not as iconic. There's not as many fun moments. There's, there's all these things like this giant slime all over the uh, museum and Statue of Liberty moving through it, uh, through the city. But actually, like, that didn't work next to that first one because it had to be the same scale. It had to be a matching pair. So, so that's why we did the second one uh, like this where essentially I took those moments and I, I sort of built out from, a, from some stills from the movie and made it just a bit more expansive. A lot of the time, th that is something I do actually. I, I look at the film and maybe there's a moment I want to work on. It'll either be from a different angle or something like that, but normally it's kind of like, okay, this is the widescreen moment from the film. I'm going to make it into a, a large piece or something like that. It, it, it's always about taking something and making it a bit more expansive for me. And then we did something for the third film. And this was, um, you know, the third film was, I think, very unfairly uh, overlooked. Like, for me, I enjoyed that film. And, and when it came along... Um, it never really got the chance, to be honest with you. It, it just didn't get a chance due to the internet being a ridiculous place. But I got to do this based solely off the back of, um, they, they sort of said, we want you to do a third one to match up with those first two. But the film wasn't out yet. So it's like, there, there's a trailer out, there's a 60 second trailer. So we had to come up with this based completely on the trailer. Um, and they, of course they can't tell you anything. They're not gonna tell you what's actually happening in the film. Um, so, I just sort of took these moments and pulled them together. Like that doesn't technically happen in the film, but it, it's close enough. Uh, but, but for me, that film was so super colorful in the trailer alone. 
And visually, man, that film is stunning. Like, people need to reappraise that film for what it had, did do visually. And uh, I, think, I think it's just, uh, it's a real shame it didn't get a chance to shine. So we did, we did these, these three really cool steel books, and uh, that was a really, really nice project to work on. They look amazing in person as well. And then Star Wars, the big one. So obviously Star Wars is a pretty important franchise, I guess. Um, people love it. I love it. Um, it was something that growing up, I didn't really, I wasn't really the right age to properly get into it. I was too young for the original trilogy. The second trilogy, I didn't care because I was 16. And so like at the moment, I'm loving Star Wars. Uh, but again, so much artwork out there by amazing people even more so than Ghostbusters. Like, Star Wars, there is, I, there, is, there is no idea that hasn't been done already, to be honest with you. I, I think it's, it's all about coming up with new compositions and new spins on things, and it's, it's why I've ended up doing scenes like this that you wouldn't think would be necessarily a scene to tackle. Um, but the, the, the clients I'm working with for this, they, you know, they've got the license to do it, but it has to be quite accurate. There's not, there's, to be honest, there's not a lot of room with Star Wars to, uh, to go too crazy. But it's, it has meant I've been able to do some really, really fun pieces. And, you know, something like this, it's not a scene where you go, yeah, that's going to make for a really dynamic screen print. But, you know, I just took that moment, and it's an important moment in the film, so we try and make it, you know, a beautiful scene. And this is actually the, the first Star Wars one I did, and the first piece I did on my Cintiq as well, which you can kind of tell by how crazy I went with the detail. Um, but the, the most important project I got to work on with Star Wars was Force Awakens. So this was a really, really interesting project because it, it came along, uh, obviously Force Awakens, the world went crazy. No one really knew anything about the film or what was going to happen with it. And there weren't many details out there and they still weren't, to be honest, like very close to the film coming out. So I was approached to work on four, four posters that would be available at the launch of the film. Every, every week for the first month in IMAX cinemas in the UK and America, you would get one of these posters. And each week a new one would be revealed. And I was like, of course I'm going to do that, yeah. But the problem again was they weren't going to tell me anything. I had, I had to guess based on the 30 second teaser trailer what to draw. So I came up with these four posters, the ideas for them, based on the trailer and any little tiny bit of information I could find on the internet or in a magazine. So I was like piecing together things like being like, well, she's important. That's her bike, I guess. That's in the background somewhere. She's in sand there. So it was like this weird puzzle where I pulled it all together. And the feedback that I would get would pretty much just be, yes, okay, that works. Or maybe you want to move this over here. Like there's, you know, but it wasn't, it was really quite frustrating, but also awesome at the same time, because I didn't want to spoil it for myself. Um, so we came up with, with these four pieces, all based around what I thought were the four important characters. And well, it turns out Captain Phasma wasn't that important, but it made for a pretty cool poster. And in all the promo stuff, she was really important. And, and then there's a piece like this where, you know, this, essentially this isn't, really the final battle in the film, but it certainly made it look like it was the final battle. I'm not going to spoil it, who knows, maybe some of you haven't seen it three, four years later. But, uh, it, you know, that, that was a really fun project to work on. And then, luckily, they asked me to do more after that. They basically said, okay, we want you to do the same thing again for The Last Jedi. So it's the same process where I didn't know anything going in. I, again, it was just this 30 second trailer because, um, you know, this is all like six, five months in advance. So it was all about sort of guessing what might be important. And as you can see, I put more colour into this. This is where I was experimenting more with the full, full on colour stuff. So I really enjoyed making these. And I just sort of pulled out those parts and decided what I thought was important to the film. Um, this piece is interesting because it's actually the only one that doesn't have that sort of character focal point. Uh, but, but it seemed like such an important point. And, and it actually was in the film as well. It was quite a hard one to do because I wanted to do something that really contrasted the, the red and the, the white of the sand, but um, I could never quite get it to work, so tonally it's, it's not quite what I wanted to do, but it, but it worked really well with the set. 
this was actually the easiest one uh, to put together. It was like, the minute I saw that in the trailer, I went, that's going to be one of the posters. Like, it, it sort of composes itself, you know. I, I thought, okay, that's it. And what was interesting was, it wasn't clear where that's happening, but then that's in the trailer as well in another point. And I sort of went, okay, like, I can kind of see that that bit there and that is possibly in the background. So you just sort of take a guess and go, okay, I'm going to do that. And if no one says anything, well, then I've, it's, I've guessed right, essentially. Um, and this was the toughest one because there wasn't really... Like, Snoke himself and the, uh, his guards, there wasn't much out there, but they definitely wanted to do one with him. So I actually had to base this off, like, this behind-the-scenes photo, and uh, I think Snoke's based off, like, a really small toy, but not even, like, one of the cool toys, like a sort of weird toy that has no articulation or anything. And I was like, okay, that, that I think I can make that work. And, yeah, we came up with this, you know, for me, that's been, like, one of the best projects ever to work on. Really hoping that I get to do the next four. That'd be, that'd be really nice, but I don't know. Um, and then the, the interesting thing about these projects, though, was that it, it kind of put me on a... Uh, put me in the spotlight where I'd never been before. So all of a sudden, um, especially that first one, the first of each series, all of a sudden those were on, like, the first page of Reddit. And for those of you that know, Reddit's a horrible place. Um, so... <laughs> uh, you know, my friend was like, hey, Dan, you're on, the, you're on the front page of Reddit. You should go and have a look. I went and had a look. There's like a thousand comments about that first piece. Of course, I read all of the comments. And um, I mean, yeah, you've got to really have a thick skin for some of that stuff because it was the first time that I think my work had been under that much scrutiny as well. Like pe people were sort of being like, what the hell is this? Um, so, so here's a few of my, my favorite comments. Um, <laughs> And I think that's really funny because it's like, yeah, I, I am the guy that used to do those metal cover albums. Um, and also I think it's, it's one of those things, it's like, is it that cringeworthy that a guy like six years later is doing something else? I don't know. Uh, also, it kind of makes it seem like those metal albums were not cool. I don't know. It's just a weird thing to say. Um, but I mean, that's fair. Everything does look like spaghetti. Uh, I don't like it, just straight to the point. Carved pumpkin, that's a good one. And then just more spaghetti. Everyone just kept saying it looked like spaghetti and noodles, which I get, like there's lots of lines everywhere. And do you know what, it's one of those things where now I'm kind of, you know what, some people don't like my style, that's fine, like, it, some people do like it. So, and I, I've managed to make a career out of what I'm doing, so I'm, I, I guess you sort of, you make peace with the fact that not everyone's gonna like what you're doing. And I think, especially in this day and age, when you're putting stuff out there on Instagram, on your website, wherever, any social media, there's always going to be the possibility of, you know, people being the worst people. Um, and you kind of take, you, you also, you can take that stuff on board as well. Um, and then, you know, there's that fan art. People say it's fan art all the time. And I, I sort of think that that's a really interesting term to use because... I don't know that that's a bad term to use because I am a fan of all of these things. I love the things that I'm working on. And so it's like, yeah, it is fan art that the studio paid me to do. I, d I don't know. Like, it, it's one of those really weird things where if I wasn't a fan of it, I wouldn't put as much passion into it. Um, and I, I just love this guy when he said, yeah, I'm sure he is a fan. And that's the thing, I am, of all of the stuff I'm working on. Like, all I want to do is kind of... Uh, be true and pay reverence to these franchises that are really important to people and they're important to me too. Um, so that's what I try and put into my work all the time. And I think if you can put that into your work as well, like that really does shine through. And that is, uh, that is pretty much my talk for today. Thank you uh, and I'll see you in a bit. Bye.